This is Kinda Murdery Season 1, Ghost Towns of the Mojave Desert, presented by Criminal Content. You're rocketing down the 15 freeway between Vegas and L.A. It's a scorched wasteland of Airstream meth labs and unrelenting heat. This is no place you'd want to stop. But the car's on fumes, so you take the exit and you pull up to the gas station. It's abandoned. A concrete canvas that some local Michelangelo's turned into the Sistine Chapel of spray paint penis. A grave marker for every crazy story lost in the desert sands. These are the ghost towns of the Mojave Desert. And this is Kinda Murdery. Hey everybody and welcome to Kinda Murdery Season 1, Ghost Towns of the Mojave Desert. I'm your host, Zevin Odelberg. Thanks for deciding to be here. Today we explore the Kinda Murdery Ghost Town of Caliente, Nevada. Located just off the 93 Highway, 150 miles northeast of Las Vegas and 740 miles from Salt Lake City, Utah, Caliente was founded in 1901 and called Culverwell after a nearby ranch. The name soon changed to Calientes in honor of the hot springs there. And then, in a fit of American linguistic peak, the plural S was dropped, giving birth to the modern town of just plain old Caliente, whose population of under 1,100 people qualifies it as the least populated incorporated community in the great state of Nevada. Like many ghost towns across our nation, places founded before the advent of Dwight Eisenhower and the Great American Highway, snake oil salesmen from the railroads tricked Caliente into thinking it was more than just a way station on the route from Salt Lake to Los Angeles. In 1923, the Salt Lake Railroad and then the Union Pacific built the Caliente train depot. And salad days followed as the population swelled to 5,000 people. But in the 1940s, the move from steam to diesel locomotives with their ability to travel greater distances without the need for water made Caliente a largely unnecessary stop on the trip from Salt Lake to Los Angeles. And so, only 20 years after its peak, Caliente's decline had already begun. The Caliente station serviced its last locomotive, the Amtrak Desert Wind, in 1993. Today, the impressive white stucco and red tile roofed building is home to a railroad museum. And the town of Caliente is home to a 120-year history of being kind of murdery. Pretty darn murdery. And absolutely, positively, super duper murdery. Hey everybody, once again thank you for deciding to spend your time with us. I'm here as always with Sean Christensen from Criminal Content. Hey Sean. Hey buddy. And my on-air producer, Adam Volrich. Say hi to the listeners, Adam. Hey, hey. I'm like the uh, donkey to your Shrek, you think? Uh, spot on. <laughs> um, and also joining me today as this episode's special guest host is animation producer, writer, director, and my buddy for almost 20 years now, the pride of Philly by way of the Emerald Isles, Mr. Niall Madden. <laughs> hey, Niall. How you doing? Hey, how you doing? So, Niall, I uh, hear you used to do your animation in the Rams building across from the Fox lot. Apparently, you've got a ghost story. You want to tell us about that? Yeah. That, oh, man, that was a weird, weird building. So, this was the Rams. This is the building the Rams were based out of uh, until from, from the 60s to about, I think, 1994 is when they left for the first time. The building was empty. All right? It was a three-story building. The building was empty. It looked like it was designed by the same people who did, like, Hitler's bunker. Because I was on the second floor. There was no windows, nothing. I don't even know who designs a building where there's no windows on one of the floors. It was just concrete. And uh, the building was going to be renovated a year later. So they were like, all right, you can use this space and do it as, whatever you want with it. I was on the second floor. 
Like I said, no windows, no furniture. There was just a draft at all times. I, anytime I was in there, how is there dog, a draft in a windowless concrete bunker? Explain exactly. That to me. Exa- no, I'll tell you. I'll explain this to me. How come when it rained, it literally poured onto my computer? There was a floor above me. There was office space above me. When it rained outside, it would come in through the ceiling and onto my my desk and my computer with like asbestos raining down on top. So you were a highly valued employee, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> well, I was the only one in the. I was the only one in the building. And I was literally just talk in and out of a vocal booth doing the voices for this animation, like talking to myself. Oh, my God. But, but strange things started happening because I'd be there like really late at night. There was a lot of family heirlooms in this building. They were using it sort of for storage and they were getting ready to gut the whole thing and renovate it. So people had been coming and moving boxes and going through all these things, right? The elevator used to be going up and down at night on its own. I'd keep the lights off. It was really strange. I don't know what the hell got into me. I just eventually stopped being like scared of it. You know, you spend so much time, you're not really scared. So you, you went full Jack in the House in The Shining. It's like all work and no play makes Niall a dull boy. I did. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. I did. And then one, one day, um, uh, I'll never forget it. Uh, the, the, I could hear the movers. They were taking, like, the desks out upstairs, moving all this furniture around. They were talking forever. This is, like, a, I'm going to say, like, 9.30 at night on a Saturday night. And um, I went back towards the bathroom and looked out to the parking lot to see, like, if the moving truck was, how big it was, like, how long they were going to be there. And I suddenly realized there was absolutely no one in the building but me. I was the only one in the building. Damn. But I had been hearing this. I mean, my blood ran Whoa. cold. Oh, yeah. I mean, my dog would go nuts in there and all, the whole time, just be barking and whining. She fucking hated being in there. It was the, I mean, it was like the weirdest energy. Anyone ever went in there was like, who the fuck designed this place? It is eerie. There was but a, you loved it. You would stay there 24 hours a day with the lights off is what you're telling true. me. It's true, yeah. Was, it was your he- your creative heaven. Well, no, I mean, the ha- I mean, I, the building, uh, I was like, I am home. I don't need to go home. I'm home. <laughs> It was now I building. understand why I didn't hear from you or see you for years. You were, you were. I know. I didn't hear from building. him, see him for four years either. I had no idea about this weird building. He was sort of yeah, I was that man cave. Yeah, I mean, it was a uh, look. It, it was an independent project that it was. It, it was an insane workload, split up between two guys, basically doing it all themselves instead of like a team of like eight two guys, people. you and the building. <laughs> yeah, the other guy was a ghost. <laughs> I mean, at one point, I was literally like, man, if there's a ghost, just please finish this for me. I can't finish this. It's too much work. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's scarier when you're not scared. That's the weirdest. I don't even know how to explain it. Mm-hmm. It's scarier when you're not scared and you know that there's something wrong with this building. There, I, it just eventually just stopped even bothering me. You're just I mean, like I literally emotional. Was like, sorry? The scary thing is when you realize that emotional numbness and horror are your new normal and you're comfortable with it. Yeah, I mean, if I went in that building now, I, I'd probably be terrified, I'm sure. But, like, because at first, when you go in, you're like, oh, my God, I don't want to work in here. This is this is terrifying. But well, I, I'm yeah, glad just, we have actual evidence of your spiritual rebirth, then. That, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I'm possessed now. All right, guys, you ready to get into it? Let's do it. Taking a quick look at the itinerary here, it's clear that the town of Caliente, Nevada has plenty of attractions for kind of murdery tourists like us. First up, we'll be working on the railroad for a tale of murder, mayhem, pump, and dump in what I'm calling the handcart homicide. Next up, get ready for your skin to crawl as we discuss Caliente's most notorious and most disgusting criminal. Fair warning, it's the Hot Springs Motel and fundamentalist Mormon church leader, Warren Jeffs. And finally, it's a tale of murdery humanity, proof that people will kill each other for just about any reason. We'll hop over to Las Vegas to uncover the consequences of serving Grandpa the wrong damn sandwich. It's June of 1910, and Salt Lake Railway worker J.B. Murphy, out on the town in Caliente on a Saturday night for a good time, grievously wounds his brother Walter Murphy and murders his friend A.E. Wirt. Let's find out how it all went down in the tale of Handcart Homicide. The Murphy brothers, their names are Walter and J.B. Murphy. They're railroad laborers working in Clover Valley Canyon. Um, It's Saturday night. 
and they they go ahead and they hook up with their buddy. His name is A.E. Wirt. That's an unfortunate name it's for an unfortunate man. They, uh, they hook up with A.E. Wirt, and this is the part I love. They hop in a hand car because they're working on the track, right? Why don't you explain to them what a hand car is? It's, it's that it's that like Indiana Jones underneath the ground in the mine, pump it up and down like a shake weight, like this is how you get the thing moving hand car. So picture three grown ass men working on the railroad, all crammed into a little hand car, like working the pump to get into town to party on a Saturday night. That's what we're dealing with. Here. Yeah, I mean, I like, really, really think that instead of these fucking scooters, we need that. That's what, we should be just getting around the city on these little carts that you pump. Yeah, sort of track, I agree. You know? That'd be amazing. That 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 should be the new public transit. They should just lay handcart track everywhere. It'd right. be great cardio for everybody, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so so this, they pump their way down into Cali. They pump their way down. Just, oh goodness! A couple guys pumping away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three guys pumping away in a handcar. Yeah. Rub a dub dub, three men in a tub. So they pump their way down into. I mean, it's it's, it's actually an appropriate verb. Let's be honest. You want to um, pump? They, yeah. What's up, they bro? pump you their pump? they pump their way down into uh, urban Caliente on Saturday night to tie one on, um, and they do, and they just get you know they get a big old bottle of whiskey and they proceed to get shit faced and shittier faced. <laughs> At some point in the night, you know, it's getting. I imagine you know because I've been there. You know, one of these guys, one of the Murphy brothers is just like really fucking a belligerent drunk. And it, like like when you're trying to take your keys away from your friend at the bar, he's like, hey, JB, you know, come on. I think it's I think it's time we uh, head on back to the work camp. You know, maybe we've had enough to drink. And JB's like, no, man, fuck you, man. No, fuck you. <laughs> And then Wirt, and can you, you be Wirt for me, Niall? What do you think? If I was like, no, man, you can't have my keys. Fuck you, man. I was told we would be pumping and going home. I was told we would return to the camp uh, to pump. <laughs> I'm not going home, man. Fuck you. But I was, I was told you. we would be pumping home very soon. Uh, right. Okay, so this is where Milton burns down the office. So as, as responsible as Wirt is, he actually gets mad. And the two of them start to like really fight and get into it. So like the fuck you turns into shoving and like where it's like that's the, you know, they're fighting, fighting, fighting. And finally, like JB's like, well, fuck this. I'm not doing this. And JB stalks off, walks right into the general store, which somehow is still open late on a Saturday night, buys a revolver. Like he's just going to straight up shoot his buddy who wanted to take his car keys rather than have him get a pump in the handcart DUI. <laughs> this is a true story. So he comes out with the gun, at which point the the Wirt's like, oh, fuck, this looks bad. And Wirt <laughs> picks up the whiskey bottle, and as he's like running back to the hand cart, he tries to throw the whiskey bottle at JB, who just bought like a dirty, dirty, hairy, wider butt line special at the Mercantile. And as he's chucking the bottle, JB fires two shots, one of which goes into his brother's shoulder, down his arm and out the hand, Ooh. and the other one goes straight into Wirt's chest and just kills him dead. Damn. Yeah, this sounds like this sounds like my 20s. You know, you go out for like a drink <laughs> after work and like fucking dead bodies, like fucking train pump carts, uh, you know, everything goes to shit. Like literally, this is a timeless tale. <laughs> like you could literally just put this on any college campus. Yeah. Basically, yeah. I just love the, the the mental picture now because you know at this point, JB probably is now like too drunk to pump. Well, the second one guy's dead and his brother's down to one arm. So it's the brother doing like the stranger on the fucking handcart. Just uh, rah, rah, like trying to get He's trying to pump out of town. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's it's yeah. for real, dude. Oh, man. Did they get, yeah, away, with, did they get away with it? Uh, uh no, no, I don't know. Uh, the la they, they did not. There was a um, there was a preliminary hearing scheduled for old JB, the the, the drunken shootist. Um, I don't know what ultimately became of him. The thing thing is that these Caliente and all these places are so fucking murdery that like we seem to think all of this is a much bigger deal than any of they any of them do. 
I mean, mm-hmm. when I'm researching for the show, I couldn't tell you the number of times that like there's some heinous murder and they give it two inches and three sentences and never mention it again. And, and this was one of those cases. There wasn't like any follow up. I mean, we are talking about a town where you can go, you can hand pump into town on a Saturday night, get <laughs> shit faced and then go next door and buy a gun. So, I mean, yeah. this is uh, this is just normal business for them. Yeah, I want to move to this town. Right. Where I belong. That's that's. America at the at the dawn of the 20th end of the 19th century I mean that's why it always cracks me up with like really hardcore libertarians who are like the America that I live in is an America where we don't have any welfare we don't have any health care everybody can have guns you know like it's like yeah we had that it was called like 1840 to about 1920 and it was fucking terrible like it was mad max without the fast cars like let's go back to the (laughs) yeah it was mad max with hand pumps warning this next story is not kind of murdery it is super gross We're about to take a look at the history of the Hot Springs Motel in Caliente and fundamentalist Mormon church leader, polygamist, cult godhead, and all-around terrible guy, Warren Jeffs. So, Niall, what we have here is the story of the Hot Springs Motel in Caliente where uh, Warren Jeffs would marry underage girls, right? Yikes. You were uh, kind enough to bring this story to us, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you take the reins on this. For seven years, uh, Warren Jess was conducting weddings between teenage girls, some as young as 14, and older men in room 15 at the motel 150 miles north of Las Vegas. And by older men, you mean himself, right? It's true, like, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. true. So this motel was strategically bought for its privacy by two of the cult's members, Meryl Jessup and Nathan Jessup. Uh, first off, I would say anybody with the last name Jessup should just immediately be thrown in jail because they're probably <laughs> up to something, and it's only a yeah. matter of time. So for seven years, this motel was a secret sort of sanctuary site where uh, these forced arranged ma- uh, marriages would take place. And maybe we should do- talk a little bit about who Warren Jeffs is for anybody who doesn't remember this, this, this crazy, crazy story. Please, please, let's talk about it. So Warren Jess was the leader of the FLDS. It's the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That is the longest fucking name for a cult ever. I, yeah. I feel like they should so have this, lost a few of these words. This guy was basically Satan in a Mr. Rogers skin suit, right? And, and, right. Yeah, he looked right. like a Radio Shack yeah. employee. He literally looked like a white <laughs> Steve Urkel. So, oh, my God. They were a He's like, sex. I did do that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> did I do that? Um, basically, uh, the, the religious sect was an offshoot of they're, they're like the the redheaded stepchild of the Mormon Church. They, you know, in 1890 they split off oh, specifically over the uh, the central issue of uh, of being able to marry polygamy, uh, plural but, marriage. Now, were they, they were they an offshoot though, or were they actually more like the pure root of the church? I feel like the modern Mormon church is actually the offshoot. You uh, know what I'm saying? They've been like condemned, saying, "Hey, we we have nothing to do with these cocksuckers well, over but here." But that's only because fundamentalist Mormon beliefs are not compatible with current modern morality. Right. I mean, all I'm saying is the, the, the fundamentalist Mormons actually believe what Joseph Smith preached. Am, I, am right. I wrong? Well, the federal government, I guess, stepped in over the issue of the plural marriages. I think uh, the church basically decided that in order to move forward, like, sim, uh, like to have some kind of like symbiotic relationship with the federal government and protections that they would give up the plural marriages. These people like drew the line in the sand and said, no, 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 no. And uh Don't you take my teenage bride. Right. And Warren Jeffs, uh, he had 78 wives himself. Yeah. Which is not bad for a guy who literally looks like the Sandy Hook shooter. (laughs) He looks exactly like that. I I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing that he managed to swindle people like this. And and, and I, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I did. I was what I was thinking because we chatted about this a little bit as you were researching, and it's pretty amazing, right? There's this thing with cult leaders where there's this insane double standard where they get to do 
one thing and everybody else has to do something else that's usually horrible yet they don't raise an eyebrow like uh with the heavens gators and the hail bop comet that guy was like so all you dudes you have to cut your nuts all the dudes have to cut their nuts off except me right right or at the the art essential cult move the ugly (laughs) leader shows up one morning talking about a vision he had from god where all the men besides him have to surgically remove their penis <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean that's like literally that's what happens here too yeah yeah the first thing this guy does um his father was actually the head of the church he dies in the late 90s and the first thing uh, warren jeff says is uh uh warren jeff basically lets the his wives know that they're all now his wife he's he just instantly his father's wives are now his wives yeah yeah he just Ooh. picked them up so, I mean, we've all wanted to bang our stepmom at one time or another, but that's another <laughs> level. Well, then he just immediately starts looking around the room, seeing the threat of all the other sort of fertile men in the room. Because <laughs> you got to remember, I think this guy could probably, first off, this guy definitely had a micro penis. You could just tell by looking at him. I think this guy could do maybe one push up <laughs> max on his knees. Yeah. And didn't you tell me that he had 78 wives, but only three children? I mean, yeah, yeah, that doesn't, right. yeah, that is a strange, yeah, that's an amazing. That's a micro little, penis. He probably had to come in a petri dish first, and then use like an eyedropper for the three that he got. I don't know, man. He had an insatiable appetite for fucking. Yeah. And so what did he do with the he, fertile boys? We didn't he have some? He would like send them off or something. What was yeah, that? Yeah, he took all like anybody aged eleven or twelve. He just like immediately sent them out into the desert. They called them the Lost Boys. They would just like drive them out like Harry and the Hendersons to like the edge of the woods, basically, and just be like go home. <laughs> you're, you're, this is your home. Get out of here. Uh, they would just literally leave them in the desert to die. And uh, they, you know, when they came back, he was like, "Don't look them in the eyes. Forget about them. They're gone. Only look at me." Those boys have bigger penises. And didn't he give them jobs with like rusty farmer? It's like your job is to clean the combine tractor with your penis or something. Like were yeah. like basically no, he just, highly he, dangerous things. Any they had boy to do. that was like a threat, any boy that was like attractive or seemed like he would grow up to be strong, big and strong, anyone who could challenge his supremacy was pretty much banished banished to work with the most dangerous machinery. So they're just basically reaching their arms into spinning rusty blades while he's just kind of standing guard, being like, yeah, get on in there with your hand all the way in there. I swear it's in there. It's so, just re- yeah, it was very yeah. obvious. And, and an- another really, really interesting part about the uniform look of all the women is, and this is uh, 1997 that starts... They are. They all look exactly like Elaine Bennis, season one, Seinfeld. They have that giant wall <laughs> of hair, and they are all wearing like a huge cloak uh, down to the ankles. It's 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 amazing. It just looks like the guy's obsessed with Seinfeld with with Elaine. <laughs> and so you're saying he had the hots for Julie, Julie Louise Dreyfus and married teenage her seventy eight times. Yeah, and a huge wall of hair. He loved the wall, and and the fabric. Yeah, <laughs> I think. Every single cult is, ends up exactly like this. They eventually start <laughs> looking like they're wearing a, an oversized uh, men's shirt from like the discount rack at Marshalls or Ross. You know what I mean? I don't know where these clothes come from or what the inspiration is. So the you're telling me it, Ellen DeGeneres escaped from a cult at some point because yeah. you're just describing her fashion choices right now. Yeah. She's handsome. <laughs> dresses handsomely. So, yeah. Every one of these marriages took place in room 15, which is which is just strange. I mean, Holy Lord. Yeah, I just picture in this like motel. It's a very unassuming uh, building. It was sold after the scandal. So it was just sold off to the Las Vegas, some Las Vegas real estate group. But, you know, I'm just picturing like Castle Grayskull with like the thunderclouds <laughs> above it. It's like the most <laughs> insane. Sedu- I mean, it has to be fucking haunted. It has to be. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. This is a vile, broken vile story. Dreams. Yeah. Does he live does he live in, in Caliente or he just marries there? No, that's interesting. He would travel 160 miles, uh, specifically. They would, you know, they would all caravan together, specifically because uh child trafficking laws weren't as explicit in this part of Nevada as it was in Utah and Arizona. He was eventually oh arrested God, in a compound in Texas. So this is horrible. So basically, like I don't know if any of you guys read epic fantasy novels, but I do. And there's this concept where like a, a very powerful sorcerer can create like a pocket dimension 
where like it's a, just a small a small reality that he's able to sort of live in in command that's outside of our reality. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like Caliente and more specifically the Hot Springs Motel was like Warren Jeff's pocket dimension. Like he was going there because he owned the town, he owned the motel, and back to this idea of liminal space and basically limboing under or around the Ten Commandments... He went there to do exactly that. It's the right? all-time worst pocket dimension. <laughs> yes, exactly. The, exactly. Yeah, I mean, he had seventy-eight wives. But I, I think most of them were uh, adult-aged wives. But yeah, no, teenagers were. Well, married that's a off nice concession other. that he made there. Yeah, um, and it was against their will. He even like he, you know, he controlled even when when people had sex, everything. And uh, that's just a, so obviously. Um, I don't know how business is at the uh, at the Hot Springs Motel. First of all, in the answer to that, as I as we were researching this, I actually saw quite a few very recent guest reviews about how great the Hot Springs Motel is, and I kept thinking to myself, "Boy, they must really just not know a thing about Mister Jeffs here." Um, now there's another motel what down if, the uh, road. Warren from- Jeffs wrote every one of those Yelp reviews, <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> under, under pseudonyms from like the prison workstation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, he <laughs> did actually. Library. You know, it was a, it was a part of the. It was basically a part of his organization because you know members owned it. So, uh, I mean, you know, wow. What eventually happened to Warren? Uh, he is serving a life sentence. Uh, he still he still has his his ardent followers though these there's you know I mean a lot of them have moved on but uh, I think he was still trying to maintain sort of control from the uh, from the inside communicating with them but uh, wow I'm I'm amazed he's still alive actually because very often like heinous pedophiles and other prisoners like that are are murdered by prisoners in prison mm. um, but I got a belu- I yeah I just wonder if a guy who's capable of doing something like this is just you know really flex it in prison. I mean, the fact that he's alive, he must be, he must be a badass in prison if he's still alive. Uh, you know, I looked up a recent picture of him and he does have his trapezius muscles are I've like, I've seen that from like, from it the looks like one American side History of X. Yeah. From one side of the triangle to the other is like two and a half feet. Like he's just got, he's got like a pyramid of Giza neck. So you might be right that he's just like the alpha gross you know, and they just can't really mess with him. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's a tremendous piece of shit. There's no doubting that. So um, the motel was purchased in 1997, and for the next seven years, this location was was used uh, uh, for the secret arranged marriages. So it's it started in 97, and then it ran until about 2004, and then he was on the run from then until 2006 when he was captured. Is that right? That, that's, that's right, That's basically yeah. the timeline. Okay. That's right. Yeah, and he was eventually caught, I believe, in Texas. I mean, this guy was all over the place. He had everybody working for him. Everybody handed all their money over. I mean, yeah. yeah. And he had, you listen, he had about 10, he had 10,000 followers. He had quite a cult. Right. Well, and you can imagine that with the Mormon church, even the regular Mormon church, every Mormon gives 10% of their income to the church. So if you all have like 50 to 78 wives, underage or not, let's hope not, and then there's offshoot families at all, you can imagine that the, that a polygamist cult is just going to be an incredible money minting operation at some point just from all the offspring right it's true you know speaking of the more uh, the church of mormon like he, he looks like mitt romney's parasitic twin they kind of have a similar look if you squint your eyes <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> yeah, so it's like Mint Romney's out there marching with Black Lives Matter, and Warren Jeffs is out there marching with the Boogaloo Boys, right? Yeah, exactly. Like just, yeah. yeah, got it. <laughs> he looks like Quado from Total Recall. Oh my he god, does. Good call. yeah, very good call. He also looks like the Cohagen. Sorry, sorry. Cohagen gives the people the air. <laughs> I thought you said you had nine mouths to feed. What was that line you said? <laughs> I forget. <laughs> That's probably one of the best quoted movies, you know. <laughs> so you're the party victim. <laughs> so we've been talking about how these um these polygamist families have got to have at least some of them, if not Jeps, just grips of kids, right? And uh, Niall, I know you. You're from a 
an Irish Catholic immigrant family, right? And you, yeah, you had a lot of brothers and sisters, didn't you? Yeah, we. I had. There were six kids in my family. Uh, my dad was starting a cult, and he kind of stopped short. <laughs> I swear to God, I think he literally just had this many kids to shovel the snow in the winter. Yeah, was in like, what was right. it like? I mean, what was it like? Because I, I was sort of, I was a initially an only child, and then I have my sister was adopted when I was five. So, what, what was it like growing up with all these siblings? How many were there? And did you have like, were there special like rules to maintain order that your your family would enforce to deal with just uh, all the rugrats running around all the time? Yeah, my mom ran it like a North Korean labor camp. I swear, <laughs> I mean, that's listen. We had an animal hospital in our home because my mother, father are veterinarians. My brother's a veterinarian. My sister's a veterinarian. Wow. Her husband's a veterinarian. Wow. So the family practice was there. So. If it was snowing or there was like ice rain outside, they would lock the doors and make us stay outside because there were, we, you know, a slip and fall like lawsuit or something would have ended everything. So, oh my God. yeah, I mean, it, it was They'd like lock amazing. the kids outside so they could like give a cow a vasectomy or something. Is that what you're talking about? No, it was only cats and dogs. But, okay. uh, but yeah, no, I mean, snow days, you know, every kid like prays for the snow days. In my house, it was like, the door would just kick open at 4 30 a.m. and my dad would be holding a fucking shovel and one of those giant long like old like snowboarder hats just mocking <laughs> us being like get out there <laughs> they, they ever call you taking a nap oh fucking all hell would break loose <laughs> you were literally not allowed to this day i think i have a sleep disorder because of it because every time my eyes start to close I, my head snaps up but like you know you were supposed to literally just roll your sleeves up and take care of things around you and that's just the way we were it, it would start like the, the you'd start hearing kids uh They'd start their violin practice at like literally five o'clock in the morning in the bathroom, like two inches from where you were sleeping. (laughs) And it was just going on all day. My mom be screaming, running around with a metronome, going from room to room where other kids were playing violin. Like they had a whole thing. My mom would do a thing just to get in your fucking head. She would intentionally change the time of the clock to be either like 10 minutes slow or 10 minutes fast. Like just constantly just like get in your head to rattle your cage. I remember my youngest brother they used to do a thing and they would kick the door up and flip flick uh the lights on and just scream math problems in his face and then literally just <laughs> stare him down point at him and then back out of the room say nothing and just shut the door and leave the lights on were they just like this is what it was like during the troubles like like what was their excuse for <laughs> mentally terrorizing you? I, I think they just yeah they were like he's he's sleeping good a little too good <laughs> Wake that little shite up. Yeah. Oh my God. It's true, man. It's true. Like, I'll never forget my dad telling me that about Liam. He's like, I don't know. He's got great grades, but he's a little too comfortable, a little too happy. I, I can't, we can't figure it out. He's sleeping very soundly. I was really fucked up. Oh my God. So they started like creating little ways to get rattle his cage and get in his head. Speaking uh, speaking of not being able to sleep soundly, you know, you just said that your house was full of veterinarians and was essentially an animal hospital. So, yeah. seeing as this show is is kind of murdery, was was there anything kind of murdery about living in a house full of veterinarians and animal medicine? Yeah, well, animals die. So uh, the basement, the unfinished part of the basement, yeah, there was a freezer in there. I'd have to carry the bodies down. Oh my, oh my god. gosh! Oof. And then That's we would reanimate them. Pet cemetery was based on your family. No, um, no, but uh, yeah, no, you kind of see that. I mean, it is well a strange done. thing with the house. There's a lot of like energy floating around because you know a, a, a pet is a, your pet Look. is basically a, you know the perfect member of the family. You can project whatever relationship onto it that you want. It doesn't talk right. back. It's like a one-sided conversation. <laughs> so, I mean, with the way you talk about your parents just fucking with, <laughs> fucking with you guys, it's like I picture like it's your birthday instead of cake and ice cream. It's like, hey, son, I got you a cat sickle. You know, and they just like they just bring it out like frozen solid. Just try it; it's delicious. You know, no, like <laughs> no, they're not like that. Yeah, no, dude. I'll tell you a really good story. I remember one time. Uh, uh, one time, they, they, my mom's like, you need to go down and talk to your father. He, uh, he wants to talk to you about something. It was another one of these things being like, you better uh, put your nose to the grindstone. Like, a, you know, you're going to work harder. But I will never forget, he had like a laser and he was cutting like a hat. And I said, what are you doing? He's like, I'm amputating his penis. It was oh, one of those true story. Yeah, he had been hit by a car and he had to amputate the cat's penis. 
Um, so that's what then, happened to Warren Jeffs. He ran into your father on the on an off day. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said it to me, though. He said it to me. And they just stared at each other, and he didn't smile. And it was like, whose lip is going to tremble and break and just start laughing first? Yeah. No, I mean, you know, another thing that I just remembered this. Anytime, we had these little Jack Russells, and anytime they were father and son, anytime my dad or mom was yelling at us, they would start barking at my parents. They, they hated the energy of somebody, of, of people uh, fighting and yelling. But then they did this one thing, this this amazing technique that would stop every fight, like in its tracks, is the son would lay on his back and then the dad would come up and like lick his balls in front of us. <laughs> just like in between the two fighting parties, because you could not maintain you could, like he would just be on his back with his one eye staring at you while his son filleted oh him. You could not maintain your anger. <laughs> You couldn't even focus on what the fuck you were even arguing about. And it was just like every time. And no one wanted to be the one to address the fact that the dog was filleting. The father and son were filleting each other and staring oh at God. you with their eyes. I hate, to, I hate to deflate the hilarity, but like what I'm hearing from you is that these dogs were so emotionally traumatized from, <laughs> by the fighting that, that they would rather like incestually fillet each other than no. listen to you guys yell. Like, no. that's just awful. <laughs> just doing anything they could to break the tension. Like, literally anything. Just like, geniuses. that, that old joke, geniuses. the aristocrats ain't got nothing on Niles Jack Russell's dear lord. <laughs> yeah, man. They no, they they uh I mean the 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 dogs were just frantically barking all the time cuz everybody <laughs> there's thousands. Hey dad, come lick my nuts. That's what the barking was. <laughs> no, thousands and thousands of people will be coming and going from this house every single year. And the dogs were just like I was talking to my brother Keen about this. Um but my dad would walk up. The Jack Russells would run up to his pant leg and sniff it. And they would smell They're like, like I smell balls. Uh, yeah, no, no. They they would get like this like junky reaction where their 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 jaws started chattering like like it was like this chattering they couldn't control it, and it was literally just they just they fucking hated all these dogs coming and going. They had no idea what was below. They were like, "What the fuck is down there?" Every time like, I, I know you have a freezer full of cat sickles, <laughs> stop holding out on me. <laughs> oh man! Oh man! Just thinking of the, I don't know, just the endless hours of therapy maybe you've been either wanting or needing or having. I'll tell you what, what, I loved it, man. I loved it. I, I was like, uh, uh, I'd never been alone, you know what I mean? So you just always, like, there was just, the walls were sweating, you know what I mean? We were just like, there was no space, and it was great. Like, we had a, our, originally our living room was 10 by 10 foot, and all eight people we crammed there with the dogs filleting each other <laughs> to watch a movie on, like, a 13-inch TV. <laughs> And I'll tell you what, my dad loved it. My dad loved it. He was like, this is what it's about. He loved it, man. It was this like the, the American, American dream. dream. It really was. This, Sean, I think as Niall's close friends for the last 15 years or so, I think we are his group therapy. I mean, I, feel like, I feel like this, this is part of why you're so Everything that he's been building funny, up over yeah. the years is, is, is a recorded Zoom meeting, yeah. <laughs> a random recorded Zoom recording of a, of a podcast called Kind of Murdery. This I, is what he gets. <laughs> yeah, I, I, he's uh, literally never told anyone about this. This is it. We're, the, we're getting it right here. It won't make oh the cut. God. Trust me. It'll never oh, come it's, out. It will. It, it's making the cut. 1921 sort of boardwalk empire era and you'll forgive me guys if i speaking of boardwalks we're actually going to travel now from um from caliente over to vegas because i just i found this story and i, I couldn't really leave it alone so the, the the scene of the crime is lambert's restaurant in las vegas where a 60-year-old general contractor, Marcus Worley, is shot and killed by 54-year-old land and water employee, Nick Dugan. This really is the tale of the hangry grandpas. I mean, right. especially in 1921. I mean, in the late 1800s, average lifespan was your mid-40s. So these guys are like full-on Santa Claus old at 54 oh, and 60. Oh. <laughs> just, just, just keep that in mind. Like jolly, like geriatric dudes. Wow. So uh, Dugan orders a sandwich. I think we're going back to a time like that. Yeah. Post COVID, living to your mid forties is going to be like your grandfather. So yeah, Lambert's restaurant. So Dugan orders a sandwich. Let's call it a pastrami Reuben on pumpernickel. I mean, they didn't specify, but he orders a sandwich <laughs> and he orders some coffee. And the sandwich and the coffee comes, 
and he picks up the coffee, he ordered it black, and he takes a sip, and he goes, oh, 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 God, that coffee's hot. Oh, oh, I burned my tongue. Oh. And he freaks out. And, like, while his tongue is burning, while he's feeling vulnerable and triggered, he, he's like, oh, it burns so bad. And he tries to take a bite of his pastrami to just, like, calm down the, the scald. And... It ain't pastrami. It's like a fucking tuna melt on sourdough. And he looks down and he's like, this isn't my fucking sandwich either. And he just turns on the waitress and he just starts chewing her ass like so hard. Um, like as in 1921 reporter said, he called her the most vile names that had ever been uttered in the history of Las Vegas dining. Wow. I mean, so you can imagine the words chosen. But uh, He's making words up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he really, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'm, oh my god! At, at which point, you know, Mr. Marcus Worley, sixty year old contractor, just being a decent, upstanding gentleman, he turns to uh, he turns to Dugan and he says, "Hey, man, just like quiet down. Like, don't talk to her like that. She doesn't deserve it." At which point, Dugan turns his rage on Worley, and he's like, you're going to eat my sandwich like up your ass, bitch. You know, he just really, he goes off on, on the other Santa Claus guy. And then ultimately, when, when Worley's like, well, no one's going to talk to a lady like that around me, Dugan pulls out a gun, shoots him dead on the spot. Whoa. Like, he literally verbally abuses the waitress and then murders the patron that asked him to stop all because like his coffee was hot and and the, it was the wrong sandwich and, Wait, and was he really, let uh, was he let go under the stand your ground uh yeah right no what really gets me right is this idea that like these days people are like oh liberal snowflakes oh millennials are so precious they all want their avocado toast or something so Here's a dude that was the gruff grandfather of the greatest generation who's going to, like, rip a poor girl down to shreds and then murder a guy because he got the wrong sandwich and his coffee was a little too hot for his precious tongue. You tell me, like, what generation is a fucking snowflake now. Yeah, Give me a break, he's triggered dude. triggered in this situation. Right. Like, I mean, it's who not among just us the... has not been there and wanted to murder for a... a you you put know. your big boy pants on and eat the goddamn tuna melt is what I have to say. I do want to know what the sandwich was, though. I think that makes all the difference. It may have been worth it. <laughs> We're like, the one that he didn't get was, like, yeah. so good. Just, like, <laughs> the, 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 sliced <laughs> onions on a fucking moldy bread. <laughs> like, the, like, the waitress actually deserved the abuse, and Worley actually deserved to die, because, A, the sandwich I'm supposed to get is that good. It's, like, basically, so, in your scenario, Dugan basically had to work a handcart for, like, 50 miles uphill in the snow just yeah. to get his sandwich. Like, mm -hmm. he's just about dead the sled dogs have already like either died or run off and he like it's the iditarod and he stumbles through the door after dreaming about the right. sandwich in his snow tent for six months and then he gets the wrong sandwich right with the boots <laughs> with his toes sticking out of him all right well it's uh time for our five star listener review section uh this week's review comes from Adelina and Chase, and it says, fun listen, five stars. I got into the adventures of murder, uh, but Zevin may have said Dallas, Oregon, when he meant the Dallas, Oregon. I could be wrong, but I am an Oregonian. Smiley face. Never mind. I just looked it up, and there is a Dallas and a the Dallas, Oregon. <laughs> well, thank you, Adelina and Chase. You know, one thing's for sure, I do say a lot of stuff wrong on this show, uh, but everybody, please do subscribe, rate, review, and uh, we might read your review on the air. Thanks for listening. Niall, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here. I mean, I've I don't know that I've laughed that hard in a long time. I really appreciate your oh, time, your guys, friendship. Guys, I really and, appreciate you even let me doing this with you. Oh man, you are you are phenomenal. Thank you. I loved Thank it. you. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Well, for uh, Sean Christensen, Adam Volrich, and special guest host Niall Madden, I'm Zevin Odelberg, and this has been Kind of Murdery. This is Kind of Murdery. Ghost Towns of the Mojave Desert, presented by Criminal Content. You can find us online at kindamurdery.com and on all social media at kindamurdery. Email us at contact at kindamurdery.com. Listen to us on all your favorite podcasting apps, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, 
Overcast, Google, and more. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, and tell your friends about the show. 